I actually uh, changed the topic of my uh, talk today. It was supposed to be how to piss off politicians and make a living. It's actually going to be called chocolate. Now, it's going to be a very personal story, a very private story, but I want to give you guys the chance and offer to have two options. I could share a lot of interesting, juicy details, but only if the cameras are off. If the cameras are on, I'll give you the nice PR slick, kind of clean version of the story. Uh, but if you do try to film secretly, Trust me, I do it all the time, I will know. <laughs> and I will slowly tone it down. Uh -huh. But, um, this is a very private, personal story. I haven't really shared it anywhere to anybody. Um, not a lot of people know this, but the reason this talk is called Chocolate is because when I was younger, chocolate was like my heroine. Freaking loved chocolate. I would wake up 3 o'clock in the morning as a little kid and sneak around the shelves and make sure I would steal some chocolate for myself. I would pick locks. I would break down doors for chocolate as a little kid grow, growing up. I fucking love chocolate. But at the age of around eight, me and my mother, we moved to Brooklyn, New York. Now coming all the way from Poland, living a life of abundance, of family, of friends, of just being in a good position financially with my family in Poland, we moved to Brooklyn which was a complete 180 degree turn from what Poland used to be. I remember being in Brooklyn, and it was instead of Jewish people, Latinos and blacks, and first, first when I came there, I was like, oh my god, these people are transforming. I'm going to transform myself. And I was worried at first, like, oh my god, like, it was such a culture shock. It was such a whole nother weird universe where I didn't even speak the language. I didn't even know anybody, and I was thrown into the public school system. Now, in the public school system, you can only imagine an eight-year-old with weird clothes, a bowl cut at that, a weird book bag, the strange lunchbox, the weird, crazy, cold Polish food that no one's used to eating, that doesn't even speak your freaking language. My introduction to public schooling, the first day, I remember there was this kid named John, got left back. Two, uh, two grades. Dude had facial hair. He was the head above me. And my introduction to public school when I was walking, isolated, not knowing even the language, was just a straight kick in the back. And I fell down. And obviously I was bullied. I had milk thrown on me. I was choked. I was picked on every single day, and I couldn't do anything. No one in the entire school spoke Polish. No one. They didn't have ESL, which is the English learning kind of program that they have for new kids when they come in now. They didn't have that in the 90s. So I'm stuck there. And it was miserable. You couldn't do anything. Like, what can you do? Like, you don't know anyone. You can't defend yourself. You can't tell them to stop, because you don't even know what stop means. All I knew was fuck, and that wasn't a good word at all, and that didn't get me far anywhere with my language skills happening there. And it came to a point where, like, we were at the beach with my family, and I was seeing something far off in the distance, thinking that was Poland, and I was, like, begging my parents to come back. I was miserable. I was being tortured. I was being abused every single day at public school. And then my dad came to me. And he was like, you know, I have to work. Obviously, I can't be in school. You have to do this on your own. You have to tough this out. You have to stand up for yourself and fight back. So for a while, obviously, I started watching like boxing and, you know, practicing shadow boxing. I got the little waters and started lifting the waters. All of this at eight years old. And I still never had the courage to stand up for myself. And the bullying continued. The teachers were even horrible. They were like, you 
stupid immigrant. Like, what the hell are you doing? And their teachers even abused me because I was slowing the class down because I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know, I couldn't read, I couldn't speak the language, and I was holding the whole class back and they were angry at me. But I had no options in this situation. And then there's one day, I'm sitting at the lunch table by myself. I got my weird, goofy, I forgot what Polish freaking cartoon that no one understood was, lunchbox. And I open my lunchbox, and there's chocolate inside. Now, when we first came to New York City, we didn't have a lot of money. I slept in the hallway. There was rats and cockroaches everywhere where I lived. We didn't have a lot of money at all. So having chocolate once a month was what I looked forward to. It was one of the few things that like made me happy, made me feel like I'm at home. And as I'm sitting there, open up my lunchbox, John, the kid who bullies everybody, comes over. He's the one who bullied everyone. He was the top alpha kind of guy. And it's weird, kind of like society kind of runs. They look at the top dog, they look at the alpha male, and they follow his lead. And they think to get acceptance, they need to do what he does. So obviously all the other kids when he bullied me, bullied me as well, so they could build up their prominence in the kind of school society that they had. And this kid was brutal. Um, there was one situation where uh, there was another kid, Pedro, who uh, lost his father and wasn't coming into school and then came back to school with half of his body burnt. And the kids used to call him Slim Jim and Sausage Face. They were brutal. This was Brooklyn. John walks over to me, finally got my freaking chocolate. Finally got my freaking chocolate. I'm happy. I'm like, yes, here. You know, I can feel some kind of resemblance of being back home. John walks over, snatches the chocolate out of my hands, looks me square in the eyes, and eats it. I'm sitting down here. It took me a little bit of a moment, sitting down there. Grabbed the chair that I had, and I smashed it on his face. I jumped over the table, and then we started fighting. And at that moment, I lost all fucks. I did not give a fuck about anything. And at that moment, I just lost it. Some of the security guards came, they broke us up. There was no detention back then. They were just like, you know, just break the kids up. There was no, oh, you're punished. No, no, this was Brooklyn. This was public school. They didn't care about that. And then John was obviously a little bit disheveled from getting the chair to a face, but and he was like, that's it. You know, we're fighting after school, but there's no security guards. Crap. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> what the fuck did I do? And time couldn't go by any slower. Yeah. You're sitting down there. And you have this freaking freak of nature with facial hair at eight years old who was a fucking head above you, just waiting until you get out of that school. Fuck. 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 <laughs> but you know what? Whatever. I'm, I'm going to stop caring. And this is my fucking day. This is it. We went outside. Obviously, we're in a very heavy gang area. Um, there's a lot of gang members outside, and obviously he told all of them there's going to be a fight. And there was a bunch of older kids all around us. There's about 50 of them. And then it was me and John after school, no security guards, just a bunch of gang members placing bets on who was going to beat somebody's ass. And it's me and him in the schoolyard. We tussle a little bit, throws me on the ground, is able to get up, hits me a little bit. And then for some reason, from some magical moment, I just like went all the way back and I swung as hard as I could. And I hit him square in the jaw. And it was like slow motion and I relive it every single day. And his jaw twitched. And if you know if your jaw twitched, you hit it the right way, it hits a nerve in your brain and you get knocked out. 
So he's laying on the floor like this. Ow. Everyone is like, whoa, what just happened? I can't, like, and then everyone just went crazy. It was like a parade for me. They literally lifted me up and, like, carried me out of there and we were celebrating and we're going crazy because the underdog kicked his fucking ass. And that moment brings up a very important lesson that I always learn. Um, a lot of times you get bad circumstances thrown your way, good circumstances thrown your way, but it all depends on how you react. If you're going to stand up for yourself and say enough is enough, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to actually do the right thing and make sure this bully stops doing what he's doing. And learning that, you need to stand up for yourself because if you don't, you give a pinky, they're going to take a whole hand and they're going to keep abusing it and abusing it. And ever since then, obviously, um, my life got a lot better started standing up for myself. John wouldn't mess with me as much as he would. I gained the respect of others. I slowly started going after John whenever he was picking on somebody else because he knew I had the right hand that would knock him out any freaking time. And then I became accepted. And then I became the kind of like top guy who wouldn't take anyone's shit. And then life got more interesting and I got involved in a lot of bad circles, went through a lot of stuff throughout my life, um, had a bunch of friends pass away, had a friend that was shot, had a friend that was chopped up by machetes, I was jumped a number of times. A lot of people don't know this about me, uh, about my upbringing and everything that I went through when I was at a very young age. But growing up, my analogy for chocolate now is information. It's truth. And the elites, the oligarchs, the bankers, politicians, the media organizations, to me, they're, they're the Willy Wonka chocolate factory. They're eating all this chocolate, all this information, all this knowledge up for themselves and they're denying it to us. So my analogy throughout my whole life is, those motherfuckers are eating all the fucking chocolate. I want some chocolate. We deserve to know where the fucking chocolate's at. We deserve to have chocolate ourselves. And that's been my kind of gaining um, mentality behind the work that I do. Now, if you know the work that I do, it's pretty much crashing events, getting in there and asking tough questions to politicians and holding them accountable, putting them on the spot, and just getting information out there, or for me, getting chocolate out there. Um, and there's many interesting stories that come up, and many people always are like curious, like, how do you do this? How do you... Um, are able to do this. And with the bad circumstances and the good circumstances, one thing I train myself to do, and hopefully train other people to do, is to uh, implement hacks, implement programs, in in implement certain routines in your life that help you transition the really bad negative stuff into good stuff. Because even though the bad stuff did happen, if it wasn't for that bad stuff, it wouldn't make me who I am today. Now, when you do go through rough circumstances, you either come out with someone with empathy or you come out a complete asshole. <laughs> Look at Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger went through a lot of horrible stuff when he was younger with World War II, with going out there into the field, seeing his family affected by it. You see horrible situations impact people, and there's either two of those outcomes. Now, with my philosophy, it's get as much chocolate out there for everybody as much as we can because those bully assholes are fucking eating it up like the Willy Wonka factory. And I want to smash down the door and teach everyone how to do this. Slowly I've been doing that, but just to give you an example, I'll give you stories of how I crashed events before, of what I did to get into different events. A few years ago I was in New Hampshire, and in New Hampshire they had the presidential debates. I was there just covering the protest. And I'm thinking to myself, I should be inside. Why aren't I inside the Willy Wonka fucking cho chocolate factory holding these assholes accountable? Why aren't I in there? Like, why am I outside? And then my friends are telling me, no, Luke, this is impossible. You need to register three months in advance. You need to pass a background check. You go have to go through secret service. There's no way in hell they're going to let you in that place. The 
this is one of my first major events. And I'm like, screw it. You don't know unless you try. So I walk in there, go through security, and then they have a little registration desk. So there's all these cops everywhere. I had a little press pass that I made at Kinko's. On my side. A little, like, I had a Salvation Army suit that I had on me as well. So I had the fake confidence as well. And I walked up to that table, I was like, Luke Radowski, WRC. And then they're shifting through all the names and all the press passes. Like, you're not on here. Check again. Maybe you got the name wrong. No, 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 you're not on here. Check again. Sir, you're, you're not on here. You're not registered as a member of the press. Did you file? Did you, did you apply? And I said, hold on. Picked up my phone. Got out my phone. And I started going berserk on my friend who was outside. But I didn't say I was talking to my friend outside. I said I was talking to Becky, my made-up assignment editor. And I was like, Becky came all the way from fucking New York City, came all the way here for this fucking stupid event in Little Ash, New Hampshire, and you, you, I don't care about the baby, I don't care about your mortgage, you're fired! I fucking sick that I went berserk. I went batshit crazy. And I'm literally banging on the table. The ladies are, oh no, no, okay, sir, 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 it's okay, it's okay, sir, 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 we, We'll, we'll just put you in. We'll just put you in. So, I'm like, okay, me and my friend, he's outside. <laughs> and they gave me press credentials to the first ever major Willy Wonka fake chocolate factory that I was in. I'm in there and I'm fucking hounding everybody. Joe Biden, Bill Richardson, sweating his ass off because I'm going at him at the Bohemian Grove. My friend, me and Matt, go after Giuliani's people and we're hounding them to the point where we're, cops are coming from every single direction at us. And they literally grab us, and they put us in handcuffs. And now, instead of all the major presidential candidates running for office, all the media guys are just snapping a picture of us being walked out in handcuffs. Be like, who are you? What, what's going on here? And as we're being walked away in handcuffs outside of the vet, just for asking questions, just for trying to get our share of the knowledge and information and hold these people accountable and get a little bit of fucking chocolate, we were fucking dragged out and carried out in handcuffs. And as we're being carried out, we're being carried out in front of the lady who just gave you the press credentials. <laughs> and the look on her face just gave her a little wink. I was like, thank you, dear. And, I kept and she was just flabbergasted. Like, what the fuck did I just do? But, and there's other moments, you know? Like, one thing you have to understand is, like, when you're put in rough circumstances and situations, you have to make it through. No matter what they tell you, no matter how impossible they say it is, no matter how hard they say it is, no matter how much pressure you have from society telling you, no, you're not worthy, you can't do this, you're not going to do this, just say, fuck you. Yes. I'm going to get my chocolate. <laughs> right? um, there's other events I can tell you about really quickly. Um, there's another story. I recently came from Bilderberg, also into that. Kissinger is also a good one. I got Kissinger a number of times. This is, um, I remember the third time uh, I was going to confront Henry Kissinger. Um, I remember going through all the avenues, sending emails, making phone calls, doing the official press thing. Like, hey, I'm a journalist. I want to talk to Kissinger. And obviously, I already confronted him three times, and he got really fucking mad at me a lot of those times. And they just wrote back, like, no. <laughs> no, no, three no's in an official response. I called them. I'm like, hey, I'm a journalist. I'm trying to get to the Henry Kissinger. And like, no, Luke, no. We saw your YouTube videos. No, no, no. I'm like, okay. I hung up the phone. Put on my $10 suit. I'm fucking going there. Screw this. Literally walked into the venue with my press credential. After they said no to me so many times, after they said, no, you cannot do this, you cannot be here, walked in there, went to the security guard and kept walking and got right next to freaking Henry Kissinger. And because they saw the press pass around me, they're like, oh, you're a journalist, come here. You're... Kissinger's going to do a Q&A. you got to come right here. And they literally brought me to the motherfucker. Here you go. 
and this happens all the freaking times. Ben Bernanke, same thing. Uh, no one ever got back to me. He's doing this private, exclusive luncheon in Washington, D.C. at the Society of Americas or some stupid venue or whatever it was called. No one's getting back to me. Private event, close to the press. Literally, walked in there. I see some photographers and I just decide to stand by next to them. No one noticed anything. No one even gave a damn. And, the, and then the person comes up to me and he's like, okay, Ben Bernanke is going to be coming in here. And uh, yeah, just remember, get the good photos, get his good angle, get his good side, and he's going to be walking in through here. I'm like, thank you. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Literally chased down um, Ben Bernanke as he's doing this private luncheon. There was fo photos only, so I pretended to be a photographer for 30 minutes, just taking photos of <laughs> Ben Bernanke sipping his champagne and talking and smoothing with everybody and then I like ripped out the microphone like it was a gun <laughs> and just went right at him like what'd you do at Bilderberg and then the shock <laughs> of his face and security guards were freaked out but these events keep happening and the one trend that, that's going on is that you have this pressure of like no no you can't do this you can and it's freaking easy and it's really fucking fun yeah. um, I can also share what happened at Bilderberg Bilderberg was again same thing, same thing. It's just about letting go, not giving a fuck, and just going with it. Uh, we go to the G7. I'm hanging out with some other journalists. They're like, hey, we're going to register as press for the G7. But you probably can't do that because you needed to be registered uh, two months in advance. They needed a background check. I'm like, no, it's fine. I'll just walk in with you. Walked in there, Mike Lubradowski, WRC, here you go. I'm like, you're not on the list. I'm like, that's not a problem. <laughs> like, well, it, it's liquor to check it again. Same thing. Same exact moment. And I'm like, I just came from New York. Um, and I didn't even have to say anything. They're like, okay, we'll make you one right now. You got it. Gave me a G7 press <laughs> uh, Into the G7. Out of nothing. Exactly. It's like, people People always question me on YouTube. They're like, oh, man, you're, you're an insider. You're a shill. Like, no, motherfucker, you don't understand how easy this is to actually get to these people. If you have enough confidence, if you have that, that kind of reassurance, you don't, if, if, if you have that kind of feeling within you, that energy within you, like, it, it's going to happen. It will. So we have the G7 press credentials. Just ended up covering the G7 in Munich, Germany, just a few days ago. And the Bilderberg Group meeting is happening in Austria, 15 minutes away. Thousands of journalists leave, and it's only a couple, handful of journalists there. So I have my G7 press credentials. We go up to the Bilderberg Hotel. As you know, Bilderberg, they're super paranoid with all their security and, and their huge measures. They have fighter jets, they have EMPs, they have jammers. They, they go all out with millions of dollars of security expenses. That takes them two years to set up for Bilderberg. Bilderberg Hotel's locked down. Me, my friends, Jeff and Dan, Jeff Berwick and Dan Dix, uh, Jeff Berwick of Dollar Vigilante and Dan Dix of Press for Truth. We drive up, we still have the press credentials because we literally just came from the G7. Stopped at security, we're like, yeah, uh, we're going to our hotel. What's the problem? Searched us, okay, keep going on your way. Hotel's locked down, but they saw the G7 press credentials we had on us. We go inside the hotel and freaking, I was like, you know, I can't use anything under my name. The Bilderberg Group had me freaking arrested a number of times. <laughs> like, I can't do this at all. Jeff, just go say you want to extend your stay, but keep the press pass on. <laughs> Kept the press pass on, extended a stay, got two rooms at the Bilderberg Hotel, when it's on total lockdown, and then we're walking around, and there's other people with the same press credentials uh, on their necks. And it was the White House Press Corps. The <laughs> official top mainstream media journalists were staying at the Bilderberg Hotel covering the G7, and they were there, and it was only them. There was no guests, there was nobody else. The whole hotel was only exclusively for the White House press corps, the top echelons of the mainstream horror media. And they might have thought we were just the White House press corps, because they literally said, yeah, it's fine, stay. Out of everyone else who was kicked out, and no one else was in that hotel room at all. There's other crazy stories like, us getting drunk with the White House press corps at 3 o'clock in the morning and my friend tried to fight them and then we were converting them and giving them information about Bilderberg. But one thing that definitely stands out, but that's a whole other story and that should probably be like totally secretive, but I'll just give you a little bit of it. Uh, but like, the same thing keeps happening. You know, they, the White House press corps, when we were getting hammered at like 3 o'clock in the morning, 
admit it. Like, we're just doing what we're told. Like, we're guarding our chocolate factory. We're making sure that we're doing what we're told. We're making sure we're taking orders because we have a mortgage, we have a kid. Like, we can't do any real journalism. We, we just have to puppet what we're given. It's easier for us. We make a lot more money. And they broke down after drinking with us, and they were like, you guys are freaking journalists. We're not. And that moment will always stick with me. Um, and then we were the only journalists the next day inside of there, walking around, saw the actual conference room, but more little details I can share later, later with you guys privately. But the main thing that I'm trying to show you here with these kind of stories, with my personal background, is the way I grew up, the way I came up, is like, you have to stand up for yourself, because if you don't, people will abuse you. You have to make not only a name for yourself, but you have to understand that nothing happens without your acceptance. If you don't, if you allow things, they will only get worse. If you make a decision, if you make that stance, saying, no, this is wrong, I'm going to do everything in my power, I'm not going to give a fuck, I'm going to freaking do what is right, the universe will answer to you and they will give you everything you need. And this whole journey that I've been on, it's been one of the most synchronistic, amazing, beautiful moments in my life because doors are literally opened for me everywhere I go. And all I have to do is say, I'm from WRC. And everything is just there. And if it's there for me, my dumbass who got beat up really bad and hit in the head a lot when I was younger, and that's probably not good for my development at all. If I could do this, you guys could do this. So, get your fucking chocolate. And that's it. A um, couple things. We could probably do a little Q&A with everyone here. Tomorrow, I'm doing a Change Media University boot camp, which is my official program, teaching individuals not only the A to Z's, how to start your own independent online business, how to promote your business, how to uh, launch your career into this, but how to also have the right mentality and those life hacks and those tricks that made me turn one of the worst, worst moments of my life to the best moments of my life. Uh, if you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. I could barter, I take Bitcoin, I take silver, it doesn't matter. You bring a plate of food, you could probably be a part of the program, but it's an all day long boot camp tomorrow with me. Uh, there's going to be tequila shots, there may be some laughing yoga, there's going to be meditation. It's going to be all over the place, but it's going to be fun. If you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. But q and A's, go ahead. Anybody got any questions? Go ahead. So I saw your video with uh, Grant Paul when he was very rude and then got your car fired. Uh, but now he's running. Uh, now my question is because I also check out information on the Alex Jones show. Uh, but it seems like that guy's supporting Grandpa. I was wondering what your position on that whole thing is. Very good in depth question. That's probably going to end up causing me trouble. Can you repeat the question? Um, talking about my circumstances with Rand Paul and how Alex Jones of InfoWars is now supporting him with everything that happened. Abby Martin was one of my friends. We worked together and confronted Rand Paul. She wasn't fired. They, Rand Paul threatened to fire her. Um, because we asked him questions about supporting Mitt Romney and he didn't like that and he threatened my friend's uh, job and he had the Senate say that they're going to take away all press credentials for Russia today if they don't fire her and all this other weird manipulative stuff. He couldn't do anything to me because I'm fully independent. He went after my friend who was working for a company that had relations with the Senate. Uh, Alex is his own man, let him do what he wants. People can make up their own minds on him. With Rand, I'm still like, hey, I'm just here to ask the questions. You know, you guys make up your own mind. As a journalist, like, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm not supposed to tell you what to believe. I'm not supposed to tell you what to think. I'm not supposed to inbred, uh, like, ideas into your head. I'm supposed to get you critically thinking. So that is my job. Uh, Alex is his own man. Let him do whatever he wants. So. Sure. So, yeah, when it comes to guerrilla journalism and being, like, the only person out there without official press credentials, like, that's awesome, man. Like, I, I, it's really inspirational. And, um, what's it like out there? Like, are there is there anyone else, or what would it be, it'd be like to get back in on that market? Like, you go viral all the time, so I want to know like, how does someone else get into um, alternative media? You just do it. 
Stop giving a fuck, get your chocolate. That's it. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, we could talk about this more. The answer I could give you will be 12 hours long. Doing that tomorrow. <laughs> but, it, but anybody could do this. Um, the thing that sticks out with me is like, I've been doing this for 12 years, I made a lot of mistakes. If you don't want to repeat the mistakes, if you don't want to go through some of the trials and tribulations and want a shortcut, I'll be more than happy to help you, even if you're not taking the course afterwards, if you want to talk to me. Go ahead. Uh, have you ever gotten any death threats yes. or your life? Like, what do you do to combat that? You don't give a fuck and you get your chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, um, yes, I did get a lot of uh, harassment and death threats, but seriously, if someone's going to kill you, they're not going to call you and tell you that they're going to kill you right before they do it, right? I, I mean, I know that logic. I got, like, I went through a lot. I've been banned in Canada, I've been arrested a number of times, I've been uh, harassed. Um, detained like hundreds of times. I got threatening phone calls many times early on when I started doing this. Um, I got weird phone calls when I was at a separate location at a vacation. My girlfriend got phone calls from other girls pretending to be cheating with me when I wasn't doing that. Then she got death threats if she wouldn't leave me. Uh, they put, like weird shit happens. They like put child pornography on my computer. Uh, and sent me emails saying they're going to frame me for child pornography when I'm, tra when I'm traveling across the borders if I don't stop what I'm doing. My answer is always the same. Fuck you. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> now, because you did this, I'm going to step my game up just this much more. And the first time they gave me a death threat uh, was after speaking at Brzezinski and um, another video that I did with police trying to set me up as a terrorist saying I had a bomb because I was uh, protesting. So because those two videos, when I first started my career, those were my first two videos, those videos went viral. Then they gave me the phone call. And I answered, fuck you. And I went out and got David Rockefeller, Rudolph Giuliani, and John Edwards during the campaign season, and those individual phone calls stopped. And I you know, said, like, if you're gonna do something, do it. Don't threaten me because this shit's not going to work. Obviously, you deal with a lot of hazards, but after a while, just like I said earlier on, it's all the circumstances. Some are good, some are bad. How you deal with them, how you react, because your reaction is everything matters most. And even though you may be in a shitty position, you can turn that shitty position into an amazing opportunity. So let them fuck with me. The more they fuck with me, the more they boost me up. And that's always been the case. Dude, dot com.